I'm gonna what I want to talk about today is is not not so, it is pretty insect heavy, but the message isn't strictly about insects. It's really about moments of wonder and sort of what happens when they enter our lives and what we end up doing with them. And I'm gonna tell sort of some personal stories uh, from me in my sort of journey and realizing what this means to me and how I can use it in my profession and how it's sort of changed over time for me. Um, so the first place I wanna bring you here is in this picture. Um, this is in the southeastern corner of Arizona. So about 15 miles north of the US-Mexico border and just right on the border of New Mexico. And so in the background there, that strip of mountains here is the Chiricahua Mountains. And right now we're in the Chihuahuan Desert and you're looking down at this pile of dirt on the ground. And so that pile of dirt is something I spent a lot of time working on about 10 or so years ago. Underneath there is a colony of ants. The ants are called Nova Messer Cacarelli, that's the name. And so there's a hole in the middle of that sort of pile there. And in that hole is a whole entire colony of ants that stretches down about seven or eight feet underground. And there's about 7,000 of these workers on the right here that live in there and there's one queen. Um, in that colony. So about 10 or so years ago, I was a grad student at Arizona State University getting my PhD in biology and I was working on these ants. Um, they're really nice looking ants. They're very long legged. They're pretty reasonably big ants. Like if you found a carpenter ant in your yard, be uh, slightly smaller than that, but almost the same size. And so um, I've been working on ants for a long time, so the first I needed a job in college, so the first job I got was washing dishes in an ant lab, someone who researched fire ants at, at Florida State University. I didn't know anything about ants at all. I didn't know you could have a job studying ants. We'll get more to that in the, in the, in the further on in the talk. Um, but I started working there, and I just sort of never quit, um, and I've been studying ants and insects for the rest of the time. And so, as I said, I grew up in Florida. I went to school in Florida. And in Florida, if you wanna get a whole colony of ants out of the ground, you just start digging. You dig a giant hole. So um, I'm about six foot three, six foot four. Um, the picture on the right is me as a college student collecting a colony of harvester ants. I'm standing up in the bottom of that pit. Um, I couldn't actually get out. Someone had to like um, uh, reach down and pull me out. It was, it was too deep. So in Florida, it's really easy to get ants. Um, and then I went to Arizona, I started working more on ants and insects, and I discovered these things. I labeled them in this uh, scientific uh, illustration here. Three of those things are, are things called rocks. Those are things I hadn't really encountered before. And, and in Florida, it's all just sand. And so um, I don't know if you've ever tried this, but if you've ever tried to stick a shovel into a rock, uh, it doesn't really work, it just kind of bounces up. Um, so it's really hard to dig. So I was sort of stuck um, in this landscape trying to study these ants, but I had no way of getting those 7,000 ants out of the ground. Luckily, um, one of my friends had been reading a little bit about these things. On the left of the screen, these are called army ants. So you might know army ants from like um, nature documentaries, maybe like a, a BBC documentary of these things that are millions of ants forming long trails, living in bivouac, sort of hunting in the understory of the tropical jungles. Um, they're apex predators uh, where they live in the tropics. We also have army ants here in North Carolina and in the US. Like these the ones that we have in North Carolina look a lot like uh, these ones that are pictured here from Arizona. They tend to be, the ones we have in the US are, are super small, they're subterranean, they're blind. You see the picture there, they, they have one little tiny little eye spot. Um, but again, they do the same things that those big tropical army ants do, is they, they sort of run around underground, dig, dig into other ant nests, other insect sort of um, habitats, and then they, they, they feed on them, they prey on the other insects. So um, where I was working, the, one of my, my study species was actually a favorite a target for one species of army ant. Um, so we figured out, that instead of digging, like I would normally do in Florida, we could actually go and collect tons of army ants. And then um, I'm gonna show you on the right, that's my hand, and I'm dumping in uh, about 100 army ants into the nest entrance of my target species here, Nova Messer. And I'm gonna show you what happens. So those tiny little ants there, 
And then about 30 seconds later, all the ants start streaming out. They're carrying in their mouths. They're young. So those are the pupa that they're running around this rock with. They're all leaving their nests as quick as they can to sort of avoid being ransacked by these army ants. And what you can't see off frame is I'm sitting there with a vacuum cleaner sucking up all these ants. So I'm just sitting on the ground, like literally with a vacuum cleaner sucking up 7,000 ants. And then I have an entire colony. Whereas before, uh, when I worked in Florida, you'd spend eight hours digging a 10 foot deep hole to get the ants out of the ground. And here it's about a two minute process once you find the army ants and once you have your handy vacuum cleaner to vacuum clean up the ants. So cool, a cool little magic trick there. Um, so that was, that was just to get the ants out of the ground. So um, what I was studying about 10 years ago was um, how reproduction is regulated within a colony. So the defining thing of an ant, of an ant colony, right, is you have a queen, that's the individual that is responsible for laying all the eggs, for producing all the workers, all the new queens, everything has to do with reproduction is the queen's task. So it turns out that in almost all ants and almost all social insects, um, ants, bees, and wasps uh, in particular, workers can still actually lay their own eggs and have their own offspring. So they retain functional ovaries. When they lay an egg, um, they don't even have to fertilize it. It'll just develop into a male, which is a wing form, which will fly out and mate. But that's a way for that individual worker to actually um, spread their sort of um, genes into the next generation by actually reproducing. And you could imagine that if you're an ant society, it's really bad to have a bunch of workers that stop working and start reproducing on their own. That's not how an ant society is supposed to work. There's only supposed to be one or a few individuals that actually reproduce. The rest are just supposed to play along, be workers, keep up the colony, uh, maintain the queen's offspring, raise their sister workers, everything like that. So I was studying the actual mechanisms for that. And so one of the things that I started out studying and found was that when one of these workers sort of stops working and starts laying her own eggs, um, the rest of the workers can tell. They can actually walk up to her, touch her with their, their antennae, and actually, actually um, figure out that she's actually reproducing. So what they do when that happens is this. So that worker in the middle, um, the one that's sort of raised up, looks like um, she just kicked the game-winning soccer goal. Um, she didn't, ants don't play soccer. Um, but what she actually did was she, she started to lay eggs and her sister workers uh, sniffed her out and now they're actually um, physically aggressing her to sort of stress her out and make her stop reproducing. It sort of induces a stress response in this individual and sends her back into the non-reproductive trajectory. So it's an actual physical sort of mechanism they have for that. So what my studies led to was that some workers, when they start laying eggs, can sort of escape that the, 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 the pressures of their sisters. So they, they can escape that actual punishment that they would see and they continue laying eggs. And when they do that, they become chemically indistinguishable from her queen. So they smell like a queen to the rest of the individuals in their nest. And actually the rest of the individuals can't differentiate uh, the actual queen from the advanced egg laying worker at this state. And remember that all of this is happening underground. This is all about six or seven feet underground. So there's no visual cues that these individuals are going off of. They're only going off of maybe some vibrational cues, but mostly chemical touch cues. When they touch each other with their antennae, that's how they're communicating, that's how they're learning about each other. So when this happens, when a worker reaches a, an advanced reproductive state, she becomes chemically indistinguishable from a queen, but the queen can distinguish because she knows she's a queen. So she's the only one in the colony that can actually go and sniff out a pretend queen. But it'd be really interesting, at the time, it would have been really surprising for the queen to actually do anything about it. Because once an individual queen starts reproducing, starts laying eggs, all she does is sort of lay back, lay eggs, let everyone else do everything else in the colony. And she's just a reproductive machine. She doesn't, she's not involved in scuffles within the colony, right? So the experiment that I did sort of introduced a pretend worker queen to a actual queen. And then this is what happened. So the queen would actually, as soon as she would touch that individual with their antennae, she would flare open her mandibles like this and grab on to that individual worker and then just lay into her, just go to town on her. Um, so this is a, 
one of the queens going after her daughter worker, but her daughter worker who had been, reached this advanced stage of egg laying where she became indistinguishable chemically from another, um, from another queen. And so I kept on doing more and more observations of this. Here's like screenshots from a time-lapse series. You see that on the left, the queen will enter this, this group of workers where one of them is advanced reproduction. She'll find it and she'll, again, grab a hold of that worker. And then she's gonna flip her abdomen underneath her body and point it at that worker. And then when she does this, all the rest of the workers get involved. They get really excited. They run over to her, run over to that worker, pull the two apart. And then what they're doing is actually responding to what the queen has actually sprayed on this pretend queen worker. So she has, the queen has a special gland, something that we discovered, um, that she can actually chemically mark this pretend worker and that chemical mark, once it's on that worker, leads to this. That this is a pretend queen worker who has been sprayed by this chemical from the actual queen. And this is what her nest mates actually did to her. So they actually ripped her literally from limb to limb. So the queen has a chemical death mark that she uses to actually enforce her reproductive monopoly within this colony. That's, to me, that, that was incredible. So that was, that was one instance of this research story. Wow. And the amazing thing to me is that this is all happening in complete darkness, six feet underneath this tiny little hole in the ground that's like this, right? So if you're walking in the, in the Chiricahuan Desert, you came across this patch of dirt. Uh, you wouldn't see much because these ants are mostly active at night. But it's amazing to me to know that underneath this patch of dirt, six feet under there, is this hidden drama. This stuff is playing out. This is what keeps this ant colony functional, right? And this is just one of about 16,000 species of ants that we know of, right? So that amount of detail, that, that sort of sophistication of these chemical signatures, these uh, death marks, these uh, behaviors are all just one story within one species of 16,000 different types of animals, right? And that's sort of a, a secret hidden drama um, that that work sort of uncovered. Um, so, yeah. yeah. People are just curious if you had to separate the army ants from the other ants after vacuuming. No, because I, I only put in like 50 to 100. And uh -huh. so the army ants just sort of go in there and start running around and the rest of the ants just completely come out and avoid them. Okay. So there's, there might be like a dozen or so left uh, when, when I'm sucking up all the ants, but they're, they, they don't live that long and the other ants take care of them. They fight back a little bit. Um, but, but usually it's only like 50 to 100 and that immediately triggers the entire colony to come up. Okay. Yeah. So, um, like I said, I had no exposure to actual scientists when I was growing up or as a kid. So I, none of my, my immediate family did not graduate from college. I didn't know any scientists uh, when I was growing up. Um, I didn't know that, that it could be a job to actually study ants and figure out stories like the ones I just told you. And it, it, it's always been in the back of my mind that like, what if I knew that as a kid? Like what, what if someone came up to me and told me, hey, you see that patch of dirt? Like there's ants in there. And one of them, the queen has, has this chemical death mark that she can throw on one of her workers and get it ripped apart. And that's how they become, that's how they keep reproduction in check. And if someone said that to me and walked away, I'd be like, whoa, that was a crazy person. Um, but I would also be like, wow, that's kind of, really? Are you serious? And then I think that would have interested me a little bit. I think it's a cool story, right? So I wasn't exposed to any of this stuff until I was like, you know, second year in college and needed a job desperately. Um, and so just happened to stumble into an ant research lab. So I often think about sort of what happens to these stories and, and who they get to and who gets to hear them. So back to this ant queen death mark story. So that was the research, and like any good scientist, I ended up writing it up as a publication, submitting it for publication in a peer-reviewed journal. It got in a, a pretty decent one, Animal Behavior, and this is, this is that story um, and how it exists now. Um, so to find it, to, the only way you can hear that ant death mark story is to, to search for it in an academic journal. You'd have to know a bunch of things. You'd have to know that a queen death mark is actually called a Dufour's gland, and then you'd have to know that Nova Mester cockerelli, the ants that I was talking about, used to be called a Phenogaster cockerelli. That, that species doesn't exist anymore. They got revised taxonomically, and now they have a completely different name. 
So if you knew those two pieces of information, you might be able to find this story, but then you click on it and you'd get this. You would get, um, it, especially if you're not in a university or anybody who has an academic subscription to this journal, you'd have to purchase a PDF for $35.95. I don't suggest that. This is a cool story, but it's not a $35.95 cool story. It's about maybe maybe about a 50 cent, a dollar, cool story. Whatever, whatever like an old comic book might cost. I think that's what it's worth uh, for that. Um, so this really like like kind of like, I, I don't know, this 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 kind of hurts my soul uh, when I think about this. Um, because I'm left with this question. Is this is all the work I did, is that story that I that I figured out, is this just an academic curiosity? Like are what these ants do something that's only has value to a small sort of subset of academic people who study reproductive regulation in social insect societies right because that's what i ended up producing that that's what it that's what it went out into the world as and i think the answer is no um i think these these stories like this have value and so thinking about this i i sort of this quote always rings in my head there's nothing worse than reaching the top of top of the ladder and discovering you're on the wrong wall, right? There was a bunch of work that went into actually telling that story scientifically, figuring it out. And then at the end of the day, it gets put in a place where it's inaccessible to most people. And it's written in a language that's completely inaccessible. It's filled with jargon. Um, and then it's, it ends up having a, having a value, having an actual life of maybe the, the 20 to 50 citations that'll ever bring in in the 100 years uh, or so uh, into the future where, where it's sort of accessible. And so this sort of, thinking about this sort of changed the way I approach and I, I do work and I act as a scientist. And I, I try to ask myself, what else can my profession, can my work, professional work produce? And, and really it's, it's brought me to, to sort of always having this quote in the back of my head um, I have young kids. I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old. So this is a person who's constantly in my life right now, um, who some of you might know, Fred Rogers. And this is a quote that, that uh, is always in my head from him. I'm very concerned that our society is much more interested in information than wonder. And this really like just like just reaches into my body. And that's, that's like speaking right to my soul is, is, is this idea of wonder over information and how valuable that is. Um, and when I started to think about how can I can apply this to sort of what I do is it was always there. It's always there in my work, but it's something I just keep for myself and I had used to being only keeping for myself. Because science and what I do in science starts with a moment of wonder, it starts with a moment of amazement. It starts at the point where you realize you saw something or you figured something out, or you related to something in someone that no one has before. So you've made an original thing. You, you've seen something that you think might be truly new, or, or, or thought about something, or experienced something in a way that you've never heard of before. And that is an original sort of eureka point that happens in every scientific process. And everything that comes after that is really chasing that. It's driven by a pursuit of wonder. It's driven by that initial sort of thing where you're like, did that? Did I really just see that? Or is that true? No way, really? And then that drives the hard parts of what I do, right? That drives like, that, that's what puts you 10 feet deep in the hole, is pursuit of actually trying to see is what you saw or what you think might be true actually true? And then you go through months, years of digging, digging deep holes uh, both literally and metaphorically, to sort of chase that moment of wonder and actually figure out, is it true? Like, is, is this a thing? Am I really, did I, did I really make this discovery? Did I really have this realization, right? So wonder is always there in the work. And what I've started to do is not focus on the end part and not focus on communicating the interpretation, which is producing that scientific paper. That is still a major part of, my, of what I do professionally is sharing my interpretations of, of nature, of, of an original observation. But now I realize that I shouldn't just be keeping this original sort of streak of motivation, this original sort of moment of wonder to myself. It's, it's super motivational for me to drive me through the hard parts of the research. And if it's super motivational for me, 
why can't I spread that sort of feeling of wonders, feeling of amazement, feeling of motivation, feeling of inspiration that I get from nature to other people to sort of let them in to, to my particular view of it, to my special you sort of unique observation to my unique reflection on, on what it is I saw and how I saw it, right? So that's what I do now. Um, I haven't always done that, but now this is a major part of what I do. And I, I work here, which is a place I hope many of you are familiar with if you, if you live around the Triangle. Um, this is the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, I live, I live, I, I work in that building that's attached to that giant globe. Um, so my lab here is on display, so you can actually go in the museum and I'm working behind a glass wall. Um, uh, you can most days uh, see me uh, just typing on a computer and then some days doing actual cool science stuff on a bench. Um, so I work in the evolutionary biology and behavior research lab, that's my lab. Um, and we do all our work in a fishbowl. And that is an effort uh, really to sort of communicate sort of the whole process of science. So as we do science, it's on display and accessible for people. And so special events will open up the lab. If you go to like an adult night when they're in person, um, you can come in the lab, check out what we're doing. Uh, Bug Fest is another big event where we had the lab open, things like that. So I do that to share what we work on, but I also try to communicate sort of what I'm working on, the individual moments of discovery through digital media. So I make a lot of YouTube videos, um, post those on YouTube, post those on, on my other social accounts. And that sort of is a way I can directly sort of share the moments of wonder that I experience in my job and also tell the stories of our active research going on. Um, so I wanna share a few of those with you. And this is all like within the last six months. Um, and these are all things that might be from what you might consider unexpected places uh, that you would call nature. So the first story I, that we spent, I spent a long time sharing was kind of in a remote off the beaten path place in a desert in southeastern Arizona. Um, these are not that. So I'm going to tell you, uh, I'll show you a few, introduce you to a few things that, I, that I'm uh, really struck by and I'm currently working on. It came from a dead tree on uh, NC State's campus, uh, right outside of uh, my office there. I'm gonna show you uh, a few things that came from the lid of my garbage can, and a few things that came from, on the right, a ditch just on the other side of 440 um, that I've been working in. Um, so really pristine parts of nature, um, but wonderful uh, regardless of where they are. So here's the first one. So if you peel back the bark on this dead tree, you can't anymore, the arborist uh, tore it down and mulched it, unfortunately. Um, you would have found these things. So uh, a good way to start any Friday morning is to think about fly maggots. So that's what we're gonna do for a couple of minutes here. Um, this is a fly maggot. It's, uh, the adult fly here is up on the upper right and they do this incredible thing. So this is, I'm gonna show you, um, High speed video, this is taken at um, anywhere from 3,000 to 4,000 frames per second. And this is uh, one of the incredible things that this uh, fly maggot does. It flies through outer space. <laughs> Not really. Um, it, it actually is jumping. It's using its body as a spring and it's catapulting itself into the air. So it doesn't have legs, doesn't have arms, but yet it's still uh, able to jump uh, like almost uh, very few other creatures can. And look at that height. I mean, that's just incredible. That was like a, I mean, any figure skaters up, that was like a quintuple Lutz toe loop, I think, probably. Um, so that's what one of the incredible things that it does. Um, only one other fly maggot has ever been filmed uh, in slow motion jumping like this. Um, this is the second, came from this dead tree on campus. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, you're looking at the bottom, the underbelly, of the fly maggot. And um, I didn't know it when, when I started working on this, but on the left is actually the head. So fly maggots almost don't have heads. Their heads are super receded and like kind of gone evolutionarily. Um, and up here is a really nice uh, close up baby picture of a fly maggot. Um, <laughs> and so the two little things coming out of its front are its mouth hooks. So what it was doing is actually curling its body underneath itself and using those hooks to latch on. And then it sort of stretches out and pops open like that and jumps into the air. Um, really cool sort of behavior. We think probably to escape or disperse or something like that. 
Um, so we filmed a whole bunch of them, but then uh, it's almost impossible to identify what species of fly uh, are based on their maggots. You have to actually either take genetics, take uh, the DNA from it and, and use that to ID it, or you can actually just raise them into adults. So what we did is raise them. Here is a pupa of, of a fly. And here you see um, the first emergence of an adult fly. This is a adult fly making its way into the world. Um, and it's gonna pop out of its cocoon and wiggle out for the first time and experience its, its life as a fly. These flies do nothing to us. They're just, they, they just feed off of rotten vegetation. Um, and the cool part of this is how it gets out. It actually inflates a balloon that pops out of its face. So you can see its eyes actually stretching to the side. And there's this whole sack that comes out from its, from its head. And that pops open the actual cocoon. Like, look at that. Look at its eyes just go like this. I mean, that's, that's incredible to me. Um, as a person who worked on ants, I was just like, what is going on? This is crazy. Um, here you see uh, that little inverted horseshoe between its eyes. That's the actual suture. That's where the actual balloon pops out. This face balloon is only used for getting out of the cocoon. And then once they're out, once they've established themselves as, as fully formed adults, it gets sucked back into their head and never used again. It's like a one-time use face balloon, like flies. Come on, that's, that's, that's fantastic, right? Um, so that's that. And we were able to identify it as, a, as um, um, a lance fly, a species of lance fly. So that's not the only cool thing we pulled out of this dead tree. Um, also under the tree were th was this. Uh, this is a, a larval fungus beetle. So this is a beetle larvae. Um, and it does something incredible. And it, this is actually what we think is a new form of animal locomotion. There's no other animal that, that does this movement. Um, I'm gonna show it to you here. This is, again is at 3000 frames per second. So this jumps like nothing else on earth jumps as far as we know. Um, we're, we're working on this right now, um, doing the data analysis for this. Uh, but it, it is just an incredible creature. Um, what we think it does is it, it sort of braces itself with its little a leg claws and sort of digs into the ground and then and starts flexing its body. So it's trying to push its head down, but it's holding itself. And then whenever the legs slip, the, the head curls underneath the body, the body curls up and launches itself up, kind of like, like, like going like this. And then it curls into a ball and sort of rolls away. We think also because probably a, a prey escape or dispersal mechanism. Um, but what we do know is that there's no other animal that jumps like this. Uh, usually animals use springs, like, like um, ones I'll show you in a second here. Um, nothing kind of grips the ground and does this weird little curl up jump thing like that. Um, and the incredible part to me is that both of these things were things that no one has filmed before. No one has, has sort of paid any attention before. And they were in a spot that um, about I don't know, probably at least uh, 10,000 people walked by every day, um, just in that dead tree in the middle of this uh, nicely groomed uh, college campus. They were right there the entire time. All right, this is my trash can, it's my recycling can. Uh, in December, uh, it got speckled by these things. Um, and I loaded my kids up into the car and I'm like, wait, what's going on in the trash can? I took out my phone, put it into slow-mo mode and, um, this is what would happen if I ran my finger across it. These little things started jumping around. Um, it's just iPhone slow-mo, so I don't, maybe 100 frames per second. Um, and it turns out what these things are, are these uh, cute little teddy bear dudes. Um, these are called springtails. So it's not an insect, it's close to an insect, it used to be an insect. Um, and these are things that are all around us all the time. They're one of the most abundant soil arthropods on earth. Um, they're in our yards right now. They're, they're out um, in any sort of mulch uh, space. Um, these are the globular ones. So they kind of look like sort of like, I don't know, miniature sheep or pigs or something like that. So they're called springtails because they do this. They have a tail that's tucked underneath its body. You can't see it right now. It's kind of folded under there. They use that to slap the ground and then spring into the air. I'm gonna show you what that looks like here. This one's gonna get into position here. You can sort of see its tail. It's about the size. It's a, toothpick there um, and she's gonna slap her tail down and then do that. Look at that. I'm gonna reverse it here to show it to you again. 
And here it goes again, and a jump. And it sends itself into the uh, most backflips you've ever seen in your life, uh, which is incredible. Here's the full scale of it. So there's a tiny little, poor little springtail on a, about a six centimeter uh, platform here. And uh, it's only about a millimeter high uh, in height. So from, the, from its feet to the top of its body here. And it's gonna launch itself, do all these backflips. And there it goes. Um, and at the apex, it's gonna be about 48 millimeters off the ground, 48 times its body height. It's done 18 flips. It's been rotating at 256 flips per second at a rate of 15,360 RPMs, which is about the top regulated speed of a Formula One engine, a race car engine. Um, I think it might be the fastest spinning thing on Earth, fastest spinning animal on Earth. I don't know of any other animal that spins faster than a globular springtail when it jumps. Um, only there's, so to give you an idea of, of the scientific relevance of this, there's only been one paper ever published in the history of humans on Earth uh, doing science of uh, the jump of a globular springtail, and it was filming four of them in Japan. Um, that's the extent of the, of the scientific research on this. Um, and this was, again, on my trash can uh, in Raleigh. I just live in Raleigh, so they're just everywhere. It's incredible. Incredible to me. So I thought I was done with them after I filmed a bunch of these data videos and started analyzing those. And then uh, we were walking in this tiny little park that's in a, in right outside of the 440 down in my neighborhood and in this little temporary frog pond in a ditch uh, right outside of 440, I saw this. So the surface is filled with globular springtails. Each, each little dot here is a globular springtail. And as you can see, they're having the time of their lives just jumping around off of the surface of water. And that's this is another mind-blowing moment of wonder. It's like, what is going on? Are these were on my trash can, now they're maybe a different species even, uh, just swarming this entire miniature frog pond is just jumping like it's nothing off of water. So um, this is now into quarantine time. So I brought home all my lab equipment and I set up my lab in my laundry room. Um, and I've been filming these uh, springtails when I can get them in my laundry room. So um, this uh, nice little reflection here is because it's on this, uh, it's just a glass of water. Um, and it's a still glass of water and I just put it on the glass of water. So it's standing on water right now. I've been filming their behaviors jumping on water and here's a, a vision of that. You can see the ripple when it jumps. Let me play it again. Cause it's just so, so cool to me. All right, ready? Here we go. Jumping off of water. That's awesome. And let me show you one more. Uh, this is again, just this, just a glass of water. That's it's, it's not shallow. It's, it's deep, but they're just, standing on the top of it um, and this is again slow motion I think 4,000 frames per second this one so here you go and it's going to jump and just nail the landing I mean come on you just can't get better than that I mean come on that's doing I it probably did like seven backflips just to land on its feet it's great it's fantastic uh, in my in my laundry room um, so, so yeah, so this is a really cool thing because here the cool science part of it is that the videos I showed you before of the ones jumping off that little platform, you notice when, when, they, when they were jumping, they were going backwards um, and they never jump forward off of solid ground. But when they're jumping off the surface of water, this particular type of string tail, they, can, they only jump forward. It's because their tail dips slightly into the water. And when they push off, they're actually hitting their tail. Their tail is, like, is, is terminating like this and it actually throws them forward. So in this situation, um, a jump isn't just a whole bunch of backflips, it's backflips, but it's also going forward at the same time. It's kind of like the nature's version of a Sonic the Hedgehog jump. Um, they're just kind of spinning like crazy as they jump, which is amazing. Um, so that's currently what I'm working on. And I'm really excited for these things because these are, these are moments of just like mind blowingness for me that I'm gonna spend uh, months and months, maybe years plus working on but that, again, I get the chance to share these with people like you, right? With, with anybody I talk about. If someone asks me what I'm talking about, I'm like, okay, let's sit down for a couple minutes. I'm going to tell you about my trash can and the cool things I picked off there. And I have these cool stories to share. So scientifically interesting, but it's also 
of moments of wonder that I've experienced that I can sort of try to try to bring into other people's lives. And, and once, once we have these stories of nature in our head, they give us a sense of appreciation of what's out there. The more you hear stories like this, the more you want to stop and look around and find your own stories. And there's, it, it's almost reason for conservation, right? If, if, our, if our goal is like a, as, as natural scientists, as natural historians, is to ultimately build a greater appreciation and a greater protection for the natural world, um, we're going to be more inclined to protect things, to more, more inclined to, to care about things, the more we know the stories of these hidden things. So even in tiny little spots of nature, like what's the point of having a, a green in the middle of campus, right? We should just pave it. It's like easier to walk. And here you go. Here's a new form of lo locomotion we found in this green part of campus, right? These are getting those stories out really give us a reason why to care and really make us stop and think of how incredible some of the unseen world is all around us. So I'm gonna leave you just with this, um, that I hope I've shown you that sort of my, my journey has been experiencing wonder and then immediately keeping it to myself and using that for my work. But then I've, I've sort of stopped doing that. And now my work is motivated by producing things for, for a professional audience, but also sharing things for a popular audience and sharing the real key motivation parts that enter my life and what I do with moments of wonder when they come in. And I think those are powerful things that we can all share, no matter what we do, no matter if we're scientists or, or anything. Um, the sort of key motivation things and make the things that make us stop and make, make, remind us about why we do what we do are really moments that we can share with others and really get other people sort of um, on board with, with whatever it is uh, we're working on and sharing. I have some questions. We have a couple minutes. Um, I know that we had a question from Allison asking, what kind of camera lens settings do you use to capture all of this? Oh, um, yeah, so that's um, with, a, with a phantom high-speed camera, so it can film uh, really fast. Um, and it's just with regular like DSLR macro lenses, but just with a lot of light, like tons of light. Um, and when you film that fast and you're filming tiny things that are the tip of a toothpick, um, you're not getting much light into a camera for each exposure. So it's like lights that are bright enough where if you wore like welding glasses, you yeah. can still see. Like there's, it's like shockingly bright. <laughs> um, Nathan and Eli asked if bugs scare you. Uh, yeah, sure. They Well, I should say they surprise me. Um, that it's, it's still natural to have like a like, ooh, sort of reaction <laughs> to the stuff. Um, but I, I would also say that uh, is like a moment is is also a different form of a moment of wonder. So the la the the last sort of quarantine project I have I had was um, my tree has this condition in my yard has this condition called a bacterial wet wood or slime flux, and it's where like there's a spot in the wood uh, mm -hmm. where out of the bark it just bubbles up ooze slime ooze and just drips. And that was like, oh, what's, what's wrong? This is gross. Like, what's going on? And that immediately switched to, hmm, I should like film this for 46 hours straight and like do a time lapse of all the insects that pop up. Because I bet there's a lot of cool insects that like, uh, like rotten sap. And so that's what that turned into. So like uh, moments of wonder can also be moments of disgust. Disgust and wonder are very, very similar, I think. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah. Sometimes I do get a little grossed out. Um, some, Chica wanted to know, how do you share your curiosity about nature and bugs with your children? Oh, uh, right now, one of my, one of my, my one and a half year old's favorite thing to do is to go outside and like flip the pavers in our yard and like scream and point at worms and then want to hold them. So that's what we do. <laughs> We're like out in the yard flipping, flipping stones and um, she wants to do it like every day and like I have to explain the concept of like uh, uh, like micro environments and like we can't flip it every day. We these bugs are going to go away if we flip it every day. Let's just let's have a rotation, maybe a three day rotation through all these pavers. Yeah, but we can do it. So yeah, I just sort of let them let them explore. Like I, you know, I, I I'm not I'm I'm not trying to 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 force my kids into being bug scientists or anything because like I said, like I. I wasn't, I didn't know you could do this until I was like 20 years old. Like I had no interest in it. Like just it was outside of my realm of reality, yeah. right? 
Um, so, I, you know, I let them sort of explore on their own and, and what they're into, they're into. That's awesome. Um, Chris wanted to know why YouTube over blogging or other social platforms? Oh, well, um, uh, week one, when I showed up to college at Florida State University, I, I didn't, I only applied to two colleges. I grew up in Florida. I was like, I guess I'll just apply to the state schools. I never visited and I just happened to get in one. Then I just showed up and went to school. I never even, I, the first day on campus was my first day on a college campus, really. Um, and then I was like, they have film school here? You can go to like a film. And then I, I walked over to the film and like, maybe I'll declare film. And then then you go in and it's like, oh, wait, like people had like, like real packages from when they were 16 years old and they had to apply to this a year ago. I was like, ah, uh, never mind. I don't know what this is. So film has always been like an interest of mine. Um, I, I, I took some secret film school classes at a community college while I was a biology grad student. Um, so it was always something I wanted to do and it just was a natural fit with the type of behavior research I did, which is um, a lot of filming insects on its own. So it was just a, a, a mesh of those two in interests, I guess.